Jim, what do young people worship today? What do they believe? What do they hang on to? What do they hope for? I can't speak uh, for young people, but uh, probably uh, a guess would be the same things they've always uh, celebrated, just kind of a, a joy of existence, uh, self-discovery, uh, freedom, that kind of thing. Well, there's always been a generation gap in every age, but the gap now seems to be much more of a definite cleavage. The young people today seem to feel and think differently. Mm -hmm. What do you think has brought this about? <clears throat> well, possibly it, it could have a uh, strictly sociological basis. It could be uh, the uh, uh, the genera so-called generation gap could be a result of uh, just larger numbers of young people. Uh, I think it happened after World War II. Uh, I think it's something like uh, over half the population in the United States now is uh, under 18 years of age, something like that. Politically and philosophically, the young people now seem to feel very definite ideas about the establishment, mm -hmm. old systems of governing people, and, and moral attitudes. Yeah. When I was in high school and college, uh, the kind of protest that's going on now was totally unheard of. Uh, at that time, uh, to be a teenager, to be young, was uh, uh, was really nothing. It was kind of a limbo state, and I think it's amazing. Just in in the last five years, what's happened is uh, young people have come increasingly aware of the power and the influence that they have as a group. It's really amazing. Does it surprise you that there is so much revolt on the campuses of this country against Washington and its policies? It really surprises me because, as I, as I said before, when I was growing up and when I was in school, it was, uh, that was totally unheard of. You know, students really had no power. But if you look back in history, uh, it seems to bear out the fact that Every revolution has started with students and spread to workers, and uh, I'm not predicting that there's going to be a drastic turnover in this country, but uh, uh, all the indications are there. Life does seem to become more and more involved and complex. You know, we're becoming computerized and dehumanized in that process. That bugs me. I wonder how it bothers you and your generation. There does seem to be a, a trend toward a return to a kind of uh, primitive outlook on life, a more tribal attitude, and uh, I think it's a natural reaction to industrialization. But uh, unfortunately, I think it's... Uh, it's kind of naive because I think uh, the future is going to become increasingly mechanized, computerized, as you, as you call it, and uh, I don't think there's any turning back. It's just figuring out a way to survive and thrive in that kind of society. But I don't think there's any, uh, any chance of, of going back. And uh, look at it this way, too. The uh, the hippie lifestyle is really a middle class phenomena, and it could not exist in any other society except ours, where there's such an incredible surfeit of uh, uh, goods, products, and leisure time. Uh, I think that's that's the reason for it because the generations immediately preceding ours had uh, uh, world wars and uh, depressions to contend with, and uh, for the last ten or fifteen years in this country, it's uh, 
there's time enough and there's there's money enough to live a, a kind of a flagrant uh, outrageous lifestyle which was impossible before Jim, there's a line in your book of poems which reads, The cleavage of men into actor and spectators is the central fact of our time. Well, I think that's undeniable, but I wonder, hasn't it always been that way with society? I suppose it has, but um, it's uh, with mass media and all today, it, it becomes more immediately apparent. I think what I was concerned with in that book was the fact that most people feel completely void and helpless in controlling their own destinies or con controlling the destiny of human life and uh, I think it's uh, it, it's sad more people should be involved rather than uh, designating all these uh, powers to a few individuals I think the uh, the average person whatever that is should should be a part of it somehow and I, I think everyone feels that events are just going on without their uh, knowledge or control I think it's uh, one of the tragedies of our time I, I suppose it has always been that way but now it's it's just become so obvious you know decisions are made for you in which you have no part of at all i just lament the fact that uh, so many people are uh, content with uh, living a very uh, quiet well-mannered orderly life when so many um, obvious injustices, I guess, are, are going on, and they, and they just uh, seem to ignore it somehow, or, or not, or not care at all, just let it happen, without ever becoming involved. I think that's sad. Jim, relevant to, to your theory that people should get more involved in life and thus enjoy it more, you have written a line of poetry which reads, "The spectator is a dying animal." Now, isn't that a bit of a contradiction to what you've said previously? No, it's uh, it's concerned with that same split between the actor and the audience. Uh, to me, there's something incredibly sad about a bunch of human beings sitting down watching something take place and just... When you think about it, I love movies as much as anyone else, but the, the spectacle of millions and millions of people sitting in movie theaters and in front of television sets every night watching a second or third hand reproduction of reality going on when the real world is right there in their living room or right right outside in the street or down the block somewhere I think it's uh, I think it's a tool uh, to synambulize or hypnotize people into a kind of uh, waking sleep but I think the major uh, influence in uh, the next decade or so is going to be the people I don't know what, what you'd call them except maybe the connectors the people who are able to assemble masses huge masses of people into one spot as as we've witnessed in uh, pop festivals in the last two or three years the kind of people that can assemble huge crowds in one spot I think uh, will be the, uh, the major influences on mass culture in the next decade I think the uh, the rock 
music enthusiasts have created some of the probably some of the most exciting music and theatrical events on the planet. I think they're fantastic. Well, part of Generation Gap is the difference in what people like in terms of music. Now, rock and hard rock do seem to go hand in hand with the, the younger crowd. And some of us who are a little older are confused and puzzled by that because we can't quite cotton on to this sound. Do you, can you understand that? You know, adolescence and uh, early youth, the um, the fires are burning fastest, right? And your energy level is probably at its highest, and uh, so it demands a kind of raucous, screaming type music. And uh, I'm 26 now, and uh, I'm uh, I'm getting more interested in uh, in jazz, to tell you the truth. Uh, I, I can't even listen to the radio anymore. You know, I like old, old blues, cats and uh, uh, early rock and roll and, and some other things. But frankly, I find most of it really boring. This is something that uh, distresses me a little bit. It seems that the young people like all the same kind of thing. Now, I, I want more out of the young people than just that. Yeah, well, they're <laughs> they're being programmed by their radios. They only play uh, the major the major radio stations, rock stations only play thirty songs over and over and over, twenty four hours a day. And it's been proven that what you hear the most is what you like the most. So there's really no choice involved. Someone is programming it so we are the victims of media mm -hmm. what everyone should say is the medium is the message and the message is me I mean, that's the answer is for everyone to uh, you're asking for an answer the answer is for everyone to stand up and say I'm me and be fully aware of that fact and let everyone else know it yeah. that you are yourself and express it. Jim, we're talking about communication, watching the box, etc., etc., being victimized by the media. Well, there's a sort of a voyeurism in the air today, and you have a line which says, more or less, we're all afflicted with the psychology of the voyeur. That, to me, seems to be tragic. What it is, is somehow life gets restricted to what can be seen rather than what can be touched or experienced physically. I don't know whether it's a natural uh, civilized human uh, fear of uh, involvement because you know touch can lead to a lot of uh, touch physical involvement leads to all the you know the real basic existential moments in life sex death love you know they have really nothing to do with with seeing experiencing secondhand you have to get in there and actually do it and I there just seems to be some kind of natural civilized inclination to avoid contact with the nitty-gritty of life well, we can't talk about life today with, uh, and not talk about sex. Now, th this confuses me because we have a so-called new morality, and I keep looking at it and trying to figure out what it is. There is, though, you know. I can remember when I was in high school, and even college, which wasn't that many years ago, and uh, sex was still uh, in the Victorian age. It was... Uh, very hush hush. Uh, you know, if you suspected a girl of, uh, you know, one of the ones that was doing it, you know, it was like kind of a, you know, locker room conversations and all that. And I think uh, that 
this this new group of kids that have come along have you know i mean sex will always be a mystery and will always have its hang-ups and strange things about it but they're much more free i mean it's just uh you know accepted as a fact of life and not you know not something to be uh, uh snickered about in private you know behind closed doors and all that i think there there definitely is a new style i think it it was a necessary reaction to some kind of uh weird uh repression i don't know how it started you know or when but uh it was totally unnatural and i think uh that that is one aspect of the new thing that is happening that is compl completely beneficial uh, sexual the repression of sexual energy has always been the grandest tool of a, a totalitarian system it the if everyone was uh, free in their sexual activity uh, how many people would show up for work that is that's the basic problem whether progress uh, the progress of civilization the evolution of a civilized culture is really worth it and uh, you know there have been some amazing accomplishments beautiful accomplishments but the question is is it worth it is it worth the uh, repression and that's something everyone has to answer uh, every second of their life when you when you talk to young people you, you you know you go through them you see them all the time do you get the impression from them that they think that life is worthwhile that it's worth living that it's a ball I'll tell you the damn truth I don't know that many young people I really don't I mean uh, I usually I hang out with my contemporaries and uh, I, I really don't have that much contact with young people well you're 26 you're young to me yeah but I'm over the hill. Do you wish you were ten years younger? Nah. Right. I I think generations now happen every year or maybe every month, you know, rather than it used to be, I don't know, ten years or something like that. But I think there's a, a new, things are changing so fast, there's a new generation every every year at least. Jim, I don't think there's any topic that has sort of defined the young revolution more than the topic of war. I don't know anyone who's really in favor of war, but today we seem to have an entire young generation absolutely opposed to the very idea of it. And probably because they're the ones that always fight the wars. They're the human fodder for the war machine. And uh, there just seems to be no... no way around it there's just no cause I, i'm sure it, it i'm sure the the whole basis of the war going on now is economic and uh, i think uh, young people just got tired of being grist for the mill but you know uh, it's a funny thing from the uh, the comfortable position of your tv set in your living room, war is a very, uh, no matter how horrible, well, it's the horror, it makes it very glamorous, you know. It's, it's a great drama, life and death right there, a struggle. And we're all infected from youth, you know, with um, little kids running around playing war and playing uh, cowboys and Indians or whatever, you know, it's, uh, it's somehow it's just ingrained in you from the beginning that there's something heroic, you know, proving yourself in battle and all that kind of thing. The very hero concept seems to have changed in these past few years, doesn't it? No heroes have come out of this present conflict. It's very strange. There's no, uh, there's no support for it, hardly even in the press, you know. And the young people no longer worship warriors the way we used to. Right. Somewhere in you, you have to entertain these utopian concepts that that life could work without all that struggle you know? 
Probably not, but uh, I mean, some, something in us always entertains the fantasy that the world could run without war. Well, society has always needed, apparently, to worship heroes. Now, where are young people today uh, looking for heroes? What type heroes? I think the new heroes will probably be political activists. Uh, in the 20s, it was sports figures. 30s and 40s, it was uh, movie stars and uh, uh, World War II aces and all that kind of thing. And then it, then the music uh, figures became the heroes. I think the next heroes will will probably be a more intellectual sort, political activists and perhaps scientists and uh, computer experts, people like that. People that, that have an understanding, an intellectual awareness, and a knowledge of how things run, how modern society runs, and they'll probably be the new heroes. I think uh, each generation uh, supersedes the last one in intelligence and awareness, and I think there's been a giant step recently. Uh, the young people that I've seen in my travels around, uh, you know, while they're very young and uh, naive in a lot of ways, I think they have an incredible intelligence and awareness of events that uh, far surpasses uh, the people I grew up with. I think, uh, you know, I like to be pessimistic, but I think uh, from what I've seen, uh, they're far better equipped to handle what's coming. Well, they'll have to be. Jim, in talking about life today, we have the business of a, the sexual relationship, the relationship between men and women, and we all wonder how much, much it has changed, the role of the man in modern life and the woman in modern life. We even have a horrible thing called unisex, which terrifies me. Do you think there's the much of a difference in the style of life affecting the man-woman relationship today? Well, you know, uh, when you look at history, it seems to be cyclical. There, there have been many periods in history where women were the, the major controlling influence in life. Matriarchal societies and all that kind of thing. And I, I think... Um, I think women are becoming increasingly important. <laughs> I mean, I mean, it's it's a ridiculous thing to to try and talk about, you know, in such simple terms. But I think uh, the influence of women is becoming more and more felt. Uh, I'm not sure I can expand on that, but I think you know what I mean. I think you know the the unisex trip is uh, really a cop-out. What's happening is life is becoming more and more feminized. Right. I think so. That the male is now less masculine because he has no need to be very masculine. Yeah, that's true. And, uh, yeah, there's no, uh, there's no frontier to conquer and hunting and fishing and all that. You know, I mean, it's not as... Uh, a basic survival thing, and uh, I think life is becoming increasingly feminized. And softer for man. Mm -hmm. Do you think that's good? Sure. Why? Well, I think uh, women have it all over men, really. You know, I really think they have the right idea. <laughs> Which is what? Well, uh, less inclination toward intellectualizing things and the need for formalizing and idealizing life and just simply accepting it and living it. We tend to think of women as being starry-eyed and romantic, but if you think about it, uh, most of the romanticizers and the idealists are men. Well, very true. Do you think that will change? Yeah, I think it's cyclical, but I think uh, in, a, in a 
highly complex and in industrialized system which which we're engaged in uh, machines take the place of uh, an earnest day-to-day -day tackling of survival and uh, when that disappears then uh, you get increased feminization well you're a student of the cinema you've studied cinema at UCLA and one of the things that you've written about the cinema is this. It is wrong to assume, as some have done, that cinema belongs to women. Cinema is created by men for the consolation of men. Would you enlarge upon that? Well, who makes all the films? Who runs the projection booth? You know, it's a... Uh, it's that... It's somehow it's that masculine desire to dominate life rather than just accepting it and flowing with it and I think that is responsible for the for the creation of films and uh, a lot of other things well men are dominant in the arts aren't they as writers composers actors almost everything yeah there there are very few uh, uh, female artists you think they're wise to keep out of it well uh yeah i do although you know it, it's a contradiction because i'm totally hung up in the art game but i think uh w you know women have less need to reestablish a connection with life because they are life 